So now we're going to talk about a property of light that's called polarization. Now, if I have a wave on a string, and if you imagine this is my arm is the string, then I can cause the string to vibrate up and down, or I can cause the string to vibrate uh, from side to side. Both of these will generate transverse waves that would travel along the string. Now, these two directions, which are orthogonal to one another, are called different polarizations. Now, light is a combination of an electric field and a magnetic field, both of which oscillate. And so, when it comes to defining the polarization state of light, we've got to be careful to pick one of these two fields. So, to understand better how that looks for different polarization states of light, let's have a look at a diagram. So, here we're showing uh, waves on a string. And these, of course, are transverse waves because the displacement of the medium is perpendicular to the direction of motion of the wave. So in both cases, the wave is moving in this direction. Now, if we draw our axes here, so we've got three dimensions, so we have uh, three axes. So this is the z-axis along which the wave is traveling. And then we have an x-axis and a y-axis. So here, we're having the wave uh, vibrating in the x direction. And here, where it's going up and down, we have it vibrating in the y direction. And these are two different waves. The motion is orthogonal. right? Here we have motion in the x direction. Here we have motion in the y direction. So these are clearly different waves. But they're both transverse waves. And the displacement of the medium is always orthogonal to the perpendicular to the direction of motion of the wave. So these are called different polarization states. So what we have here is an electromagnetic wave. And this is essentially what light looks like. So an electromagnetic wave contains two types of fields. It contains an electric field and it contains a magnetic field. And these oscillate in orthogonal directions. So if we redraw these axes here, so remember this was y, this was uh, x, and this direction here was z. So the wave is traveling in the z direction in both of these uh, uh, cases here. But what we can see is that the fields are rotated through 90 degrees. So in this case, we have the magnetic field in the y direction, the electric field in the x. And here we have the magnetic field in the x direction and the electric field in the y. Now, by convention, the electric field um, gives the uh, polarization state. So the polarization uh, state of light is, uh, by convention, we choose the electric field to determine the direction. So here we have light that's linearly polarized in the y direction, because it oscillates, the electric field oscillates in, in y. And here we have it polarized in the x direction, because the electric field oscillates in uh, x. But that's purely a convention, uh, and it could have been that we chose the magnetic field. But that's not what happened. We used the electric field. So this means that light has got two polarization states. We have the magnetic field in the y in one direction, and 90 degrees to that, we have the electric field. However, this is a wave in a vacuum. And so we might ask ourselves, well, why don't we have an electric field that can go in the longitudinal direction. And there is a reason for that, and it's to do with relativity and Lorentz contraction. Remember here that we have light, and it moves at the speed of light. And so in the direction of motion, the universe is Lorentz contracted to the point of non-existence. So essentially, a photon, if you take the limit as, as the velocity tends towards the speed of light, then for a photon in a vacuum, uh, you cannot actually have a, po a, a polarization in the direction of travel because this wave is traveling at the speed of light, and so relativity forbids it. What happens, though, if you have a field uh, such as the Z boson? So we talked about this a little bit when we were talking about resonances. And this is a, a heavy uh, field. It has a mass. And so the velocity is going to be always less than the speed of light. And what that means is, although the Z boson is not made of uh, a magnetic and an electric field, although it's partly actually made of those, it's also made of something called a weak uh, uh, field. And the 
thing that's interesting with the Z boson is because it has a mass, it can have the fields that make it up oscillate in the same direction of motion. And so we don't regard this as, as two transverse polarization states. We regard it as three polarization states. And so this is uh, one way that you can look at a, a longitudinal wave. You can think of longitudinal um, as uh, essentially a third polarization. So this third polarization is a longitudinal um, oscillation, where the field actually uh, oscillates in the direction of motion of the wave. But you can only do this uh, when you have a, um, a certain types of field that have mass. Um, for, for something like uh, the electromagnetic field, you don't have mass, so you can't have an oscillation in the direction of motion. Um, but this is a different way of looking at a longitudinal wave. And in fact, the reason mechanical waves we divided up between transverse and longitudinal is because there's different properties of the medium allow uh, longitudinal and transverse waves to exist, and so they propagate differently. And so for a mechanical medium, these really are two different types of waves. But at a fundamental level, when we're dealing with fundamental waves, such as the electromagnetic wave, then this is no longer applies, and the longitudinal wave really is just a third type of polarization. But for a photon, we only have two possible polarization states. So one way to produce polarized light is to use a Polaroid filter, such as this one here. So if I hold this up in front of my face, you can see that it filters out about half the light. And if I rotate it around like this, you can see no effect. I still remain uh, slightly darkened, but about half the light is uh, removed. The reason for that is that uh, the light that we see around us every day is generally unpolarized. So that means it has no preferred direction for the electric field, and so when it passes through a polarizing filter, half of it is uh, absorbed by the filter and the other half carries on, regardless of the direction of the filter. However, if I have two filters, then the first filter will produce polarized light, and we can see what happens when I put a second filter in front of it. So this overhead projector has got a uh, polarizing filter attached to it here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this, polar this second filter on top of it. And so as I move it over, you can see that the intensity decreases a little bit, but that's because the... Um, filter itself is not a perfect transmitter of light, but really there's no change in intensity when I put this second filter on top. And the reason for that is that the plane of polarization of the first filter is aligned with the plane of polarization of the second filter. However, if I start to turn this, you will see something happen to the light on the screen. So here I am turning it, and I've now got it to about 45 degrees, and what you can see is that the intensity of light on the screen now has decreased, and in fact it's decreased by roughly a factor of two. And the amount of light that's now being absorbed is a reflection of the angle between this polarizing filter and the angle of this, the, the bottom polarizing filter. And at 45 degrees, it goes as the square of the cosine of the angle. So at 45 degrees, the, you've got an intensity reduction by a factor of cosine squared 45, and that's a factor of a half. It's 1 over root 2 squared. Now, if I continue rotating it, and I get to here, and now I've got the two polarizing filters 90 degrees angle to each other, so the first polarizing filter polarizes the light this way, and the second polarizing filter only allows light that's polarized in this direction to get through, and there is no component of the light that is polarized in this direction, and so no light gets through the two filters, and the screen goes dark. And that is because we have what we call crossed polarizing filters, and so there is no uh, polarization state of light that can make it all the way through both of those two filters. So we've seen a polarization filter in action. Well, what would that look like for a mechanical wave? So here we have uh, a wave on a string. So this is a, a string that is uh, vibrating. And what we have here is a uh, um, wood 
with a slot cut out of it. And so if we have the string threaded through this slot, then this slot acts as a polarization filter. The string can only vibrate in the up and down direction, and the slot will pretty much prevent any vibrations in the uh, x direction. So we can only oscillate in y here, and so we have uh, this uh, essentially is a, uh, a polarization filter, because if the string here was oscillating in this direction, it would be stopped by this filter, which only allows the string to move up and down. So at a mechanical level, it's easy to imagine building a, a polarization filter. So what happens if we have two twisted polarization filters, as we had in the video? So here we have two filters. So uh, both of these uh, black and white things here are polarization uh, filters. And one is vertical, so this will only allow light that passes through it when it's oscillating in the vertical direction. And this one is rotated at an angle of phi to the first one. So if we think of the light as vibrating up and down, and we can think of it like a mechanical string in this instance, then really what is going to pass uh, through this uh, filter here is the component of the light that is oscillating at an angle phi to its original direction. So essentially, we're going to resolve this uh, direction here into the direction that is allowed to pass this filter. So when we do that, we're going to have the amplitude of light, because the size of this uh, oscillation is given by the amplitude. So the new amplitude is going to be equal to the original amplitude multiplied by the cosine of the angle between these two filters. So that explains the amplitude. But remember, when we're dealing with uh, a three-dimensional wave such as light, we, we dealt with it in detail with acoustic waves, then we have the, in, we're really interested in more in the intensity. And the intensity is e proportional to the amplitude squared. So if you want to know the fraction of the original intensity that is going to pass through here, then the new intensity is going to be equal to um, a i, I will call that i naught. But now, because we're squaring the amplitude, we're going to have a cosine squared term in here. So the new, uh, the intensity after the second filter is going to have this additional uh, cosine squared term. Now, supposing what we've got here is uh, unpolarized light, so let's assume now that we've got uh, unpolarized here. And that's the case for most light sources. So if we have an unpolarized beam here, and we'll call this one I0, after it's gone through a Polaroid filter, we will have a half of the original intensity, because um, we've got essentially only half the light will be uh, uh, polarized in here, or essentially what we're doing is we're taking an average of this uh, cosine. So essentially we're, we're uh, uh, taking the average cosine as we go from um, 0 all the way to pi over 2. And if we do that, we'll find that we end up with um, a value of a half. So here we're going to have a half I naught, and then here we would have a half I naught cosine squared phi. So if you remember back to the video, what we showed was that when phi was equal to 90 degrees, which is pi over 2 radians, then we got no light coming through. Well, this we can see here because here we're going to have phi is equal to pi over 2, and so cosine of pi over 2 is equal to 0, and so our new intensity will be 0 if these are at 90 degrees. However, if they're at um, pi over 4 degrees, which is 40, of pi over 4 radians, which is 45 degrees, cosine of pi over 4 is equal to 1 over root 2. And so here what we would find is that the new intensity would be equal to a half of the original intensity um, that's at um, pi over 4 or 45 degrees. So this shows how light um, intensity is reduced by a Polaroid filter. But remember, you always get a factor of a half if you have unpolarized light hitting one of these filters, because that's essentially the average value of uh, cosine squared uh, phi.
Now, we've seen how a Polaroid filter, such as this one, can filter uh, unpolarized light and make it polarized, but there's another way to make polarized light, and that's through reflection. So to show that, what we've got here is a laser, and it's generating unpolarized light, and it's reflecting off a glass block here, and we get spots on the screen here behind me. Now, the reason there are two spots instead of one is because this glass block has got a thickness, and so we get a reflection off the front surface of the block and a reflection off the back surface of the block, and so we end up with two spots here. Now, if I put my Polaroid filter in front of these two spots, so the beams are now passing through the uh, polarizing filter, and I rotate it, you can see that there is maybe a little bit of a difference in intensity, but really there's not much change in intensity. So now I'm going to alter the angle of reflection. Now, at this point, let's see what happens. Well, so I've got it at one angle, and you can see the uh, laser's getting through fine, but now, when I rotate it, the two points essentially disappear. There's a very tiny amount of light getting through. And that's because at this angle of reflection, the reflected light is almost entirely polarized. And in fact, if I accurately adjusted the angle to what is called Brewster's angle, named after David Brewster who discovered this effect, I would find that the reflected light was perfectly polarized. Now the transmitted light is only partially polarized. And the reason for that is that we don't reflect half the beam of light, we only reflect a small fraction of the beam, which is why we're using an intense source like a laser. And Although the reflected light is entirely polarized, the transmitted light contains both polarization states, but obviously less of the polarization state that's been reflected. So it's a, what we call a partially polarized refracted beam, but the reflected beam is perfectly polarized. Now, this is why, you know, if you're wanting to take pictures underwater, you want to use a Polaroid filter on your camera lens because the reflections from water will be filtered out because they're a polar, they generally tend to be polarized reflections. It's also why sunglasses are particularly effective if you're at the seaside because they will uh, filter out the polarized reflected glare of sunlight off the water. So to understand this a little bit more and show how to calculate uh, Brewster's angle, uh, let's have a look at some diagrams. So here we have a diagram of what we saw happening with the laser. We have the light coming in at an angle of incidence, and this angle of incidence is actually what is called Brewster's uh, angle. And what happens is we get a reflected beam, and this reflected beam is perfectly polarized, and the refracted beam is partially polarized. You can see here that this arrow in this direction is reduced in size because part of that uh, polarization state has been reflected here, so we get a partially polarized refracted beam. Now, at Brewster's angle, the reflected ray is at 90 degrees to the refracted ray. And if we have a look at the angle going around here, this is a straight line, so this has to be 180 degrees. And so what we can say is that the angle of reflection plus the angle of refraction must be equal to 90 degrees because we've got 180 here minus 90, which leaves 90 degrees. Now, the law of reflection, of course, tells us that Brewster's angle here is equal to the reflection angle because this is the angle of incidence. The law of reflection says angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. So I can rewrite this as theta 2 is equal to 90 degrees minus, and now instead of calling it theta r, it's going to be theta b. Okay, so that's for the reflection. What about the refraction now? Well, for refraction, we have Snell's law. And so we have that the sine of the angle of incidence, which is theta b in this case, divided by the sine of the angle of refraction, which is theta 2, is equal to n2 over n1, where we have uh, original medium with refractive index 1, and the new medium is refractive index 2. Now, if I rearrange this, then I'm going to have n1 sine theta b is equal to n2 times the sine of theta 2, 
but instead of using theta 2, I'm going to use this expression here. So that's 90 degrees minus theta b. Okay, so what's this value here? Well, let's draw a little right angle triangle here. So here's my right angle triangle, and this is going to be theta b, and so therefore this angle here is 90 minus theta b, 90 degrees minus theta b. Now if I look at the sine of this angle, it's the opposite, so that's uh, this one here divided by um, uh, this, which is the hypotenuse. But if I look at the cosine of this angle, it's the same side here divided by the hypotenuse. So this is simply equal to n2 times the cosine of theta b. So, uh, and this is equal to n1 sine theta b. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the cosine down here, and I'm going to take n1 down here, and what I end up with is sine divided by cosine, which is the tangent, and this is n2 divided by n1. And so therefore, the Brewster's angle for this uh, uh, boundary between the two media is the inverse tangent of n2 divided by n1, where n2 is the refractive index of the new medium, and n1 is the refractive index of the medium the light is originally traveling through. And so this allows us to calculate Brewster's angle for the boundary between any two media. So now we've seen how we can generate polarized light, either by using a Polaroid filter or by reflecting it off a surface at Brewster's angle, which will generate a perfectly polarized reflected beam, although the refracted beam, of course, is only partially polarized. Next, we're going to look at a property of light that actually showed that light was a wave. This was the first property that could not be explained by light behaving as a particle, and that property is interference.